You're listening to the Common Descent Podcast. Hello, Will. Hello, David. Hello, listeners, and welcome to episode 97, I mean 116, of the Common Descent Podcast. Not too far off. Ichthyosaurs. (laughs) Ichthyosaurs. <laughs> we have talked about a lot of secondarily aquatic marine animals. We've talked about the other two of the major groups of Mesozoic marine reptiles. We did Mosasaurs. We did Plesiosaurs. Our audience has been patient. It's Ichthyosaurs time. Woo! The final of the three large groups of Mesozoic marine reptiles, which is interesting because Ichthyosaurs are the first of the three chronologically yes and by many measures some might argue the most impressive of the three Hmm. ichthyosaurs have a lot of claims to fame some of which i did not know until i pulled together references for this episode so if you don't have a picture of an ichthyosaur in your head they are the fish reptiles yeah like shaped like a fish very sharky dolphinish long snout fins everywhere yep Super classic example of convergent evolution. Reptiles that look a whole heck of a lot like, like you said, fish, sharks, dolphins. Although, as I've learned, they didn't all look like that. Yeah, no, I, 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 that was something I learned more recent than not. Like, it, at getting into the career of paleontology, that there were some that actually looked fairly different. Yeah, so we'll talk about the diversity of ichthyosaurs, what we know of them, what we've learned about their evolutionary trajectory... And we'll talk about how a lot of the most important things we've learned about them are surprisingly recent discoveries. Mm. Yes, we will talk about all this, not just because ichthyosaurs are cool, but because this topic was requested, (gasps) particularly by Jonathan, Taryn, Fabio, Lloyd, and Levin. Good request. Thanks, everybody. But before we get to talking about ichthyosaurs, we've got a couple other things to do. Number one, announcements. We have a Patreon. Mm Mm-hmm. If you'd like to support the podcast in a financial sense, go ahead and be a patron. We use the funds from our Patreon to help support the podcast, to host it online, and to get ourselves equipment and supplies to make the podcast run smoothly, like this microphone and these pop filters and these fancy new chairs we're sitting in. Oh, they're so comfy. (laughs) And if you are a patron, you get all sorts of goodies, including, at a certain level, the opportunity to hear your name shouted out here on the podcast. Really? This episode, we would like to thank and welcome Maggie, Ben, Alexandra, and Mark. Thanks, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. If you're a patron, big thanks. If you're not a patron, thanks for listening. Consider it. Yeah. And speaking of extra stuff that people get to enjoy, extra stuff that everyone gets to enjoy includes our newest series of Silver Screen Science. Yeah. This month of June... We are doing a double feature of Silver Screen Science discussing the scientific perspective on Lake Placid, featuring crocs, Mm -hmm. and Anaconda, featuring snakes. Yep. Been a lot of fun to watch the movies and to record those episodes. By the time this episode releases, both of those Silver Screen Science episodes will be available for you to listen to. Yeah, check them out. It was a lot of fun to compare these two just ridiculous movies. Yeah, can you guess which one of us prefers which movie? Yeah, you'll Mm. never, you'll never get it. And if you're a patron, we record more thoughts after each Silver Screen Science episode, so check that out too. And with the announcements done, it's time for the news. News! Every episode we talk about some news from the world of paleontology and related science to keep us all up to date with what's going on in the world. Will, what's going on in the world? Crocs. (laughs) <laughs> gave him a whole movie episode to talk about crocs and he's not satisfied it's never enough <laughs> this is about what seems to be a very large extinct croc from australia what a large croc in australia but not the kind of croc we'd expect to find in right. australia you have my curiosity this is research by yorgo Rizdevsky et al in scientific reports and the article written uh, is in the conversation, so it's written by Yorgo and Stephen Salisbury. All right, and we will link to that article in the blog post associated with this episode. So this research is about a partial croc skull. So it's not a lot. They don't have most of the animal, so there's still lots to be found, hopefully, and lots to be learned 
but it's enough to ID Croc. It's a brain case, and it's enough to say Big Croc. And upon analysis, it seems to be a Tomistamine Croc. Oh, false Garial? So that's the same group as the Tomistama today, the False Garial. Okay. Which is found in the, the Indonesia region and freshwater rivers and everything around there. Which is not what we would expect to find in Australia. So Australia today has two crocs, the freshwater and saltwater croc, or estuarian or Indo-Pacific. That's the one from Lake Placid. Yeah, it is. But throughout the history fossil record, there have been many, many extinct crocs in Australia. Currently, according to this article, there are 21 named extinct croc species from Australia. Cool. And this is over the past... 66 million years, so Cenozoic crocs. The vast majority, which means 19 of those, belong to the Mekasukians. Okay. Which was a group of crocs found only in Australia and the, the Southwest Pacific. Right. Those are extinct. Those are extinct. This is an extinct group. Very diverse, successful group in that area. You had small ones, big ones, aquatic and terrestrial members. So diverse and many formed. And until... Modern crocodilus crocs, the true crocs, showed up in Australia. These were the only fossil crocs. Gotcha. So it was a homogenous uh, collection. I mean, it sounds like a diverse collection, but one group of crocs. Yes, which is weird. Yeah. Because every other continent except for Australia and Antarctica has multiple groups of crocs. Hmm. Crocodilians. Gotcha. Like here in North America, we have crocodiles and alligators. South America has caimans and crocodiles. Yep. Asia has the gharial crocs and the gator. Yep. So it's really weird to have a, especially when we include extinct groups, a homogenous continent. Right. This discovery says, nope. Oh, cool. There was a tomistamine there. We, we were missing something. Yes. Yeah, so there is some more diversity than we first realized. Now, this tomistamine is a new species, obviously. <laughs> that is Gunga Marandu Monala, which stands for... Whole-headed river boss. <laughs> the boss of the river. Yep, because it's a big croc, and whole-headed refers to large openings that would be for jaw muscle attachment. A hole, like a hole in the head. Yes. God, not entire. No. <laughs> Holes in the head of the river boss. Gotcha. You can't cross this river without talking to the boss. And this is a fairly young croc. It's two, five million years old. So very, very recent. Okay, Pliocene. Mm-hmm. So this is an exciting discovery because... It adds to the diversity of the crocs known from Australia. Agreed. But also, they were able to CT scan the section of the skull, the brain case, and get a very detailed scan of the brain. In fact, as they listed it, the most detailed scan of an extinct tomistamine yet. So, a really good look at a tomistamine brain, which is something evidently we've been lacking. Good to know. And the ancestry of this new species is interesting. Because at least according to what they have now, it's not much. It seems to be more similar to Tomistamines from Europe about 50 million years ago, despite the fact that this is a 2 to 5 million year old Tomistamine. Right, and far from Europe. And far from Europe, which suggests a ghost lineage yep. between Europe and Australia. That lasted 45 million years. Yep. <laughs> so somewhere out there in the fossil record, there should be connecting uh, relatives between those times and places. Exactly. And they were pointing toward Asia, that somewhere in Asia we should find Makes sense. some of this ghost lineage. Yeah, a ghost lineage, dear listeners, which uh, is something I will say again later in hey. the episode, <laughs> <laughs> is when you have a member of, an, of a group that is related to very ancient uh, relatives with no evidence in between. Yeah, we don't you, see how you got there. You know they were there because there's one at this age and some at that age, but you're missing the in-between for the time being. Yeah, so as long as we're correct that you are related, there has to somehow be a family tree connecting you and across locations often. Yeah. Now, they can't actually say how big this new Tomistamine right. was because it's just the brain case, but according to it, it is large. Potentially the largest known extinct croc from Australia. Oh. So like... How large are we talking? A big tomistamine. They can't say for sure, but 
It's gotcha. It just, bigger than the ones found right. so far. <laughs> How big are the ones found so far? I don't know what the biggest fossil croc is. I know that they have a few other extinct species that get up to saltwater croc size. Right. So bigger than crocs today. Bigger than the saltwater, which can max that we know is 20 foot. Right. So this could be a very large slender snout croc because almost all the Tomistamines have slender snouts. Right. I guess to get a full size estimate, they'll need to find a whole headed one. Yeah, with the W. Yeah. <laughs> Always fun to discover that a place and time had a greater diversity of animals than you thought it did. Yeah. And I don't I don't know anything about Timistamine. The only thing I know about Timistamines is that the modern day Timistama, the false gharial, has confused people trying to identify which group of modern crocodilians it belongs to. Mm -hmm. So to find that extinct Timistamines are also confusing is a lot of fun. Yeah, and uh, before this, once again, Australia and Antarctica were the only continents that didn't have Timistamines. Oh. So now we've marked one more continent cool. to be Timistamined. We're coming for you, Antarctica. <laughs> <laughs> Just gotta melt that ice. Well, speaking of large extinct animals uh, wandering across Asia, my first bit of news this episode is about giant rhinos. Cool. The giantest rhinos. Ooh. These are the Paraceratherium rhinos. Nice. Yeah, this is research by Tao Dung et al. in Communications Biology, and we will link in the blog post to an article on National Geographic by Michael Greshko. Paraceratheridae is an extinct group of rhinoceroses, but they are not like rhinos as you imagine them today. Rhinos today are, well, they're big, but they're short and stocky, and they have giant heads with big horns at the end of them. Yeah, they're stout. Very stout. Paraceratherium rhinos are kind of like rhinos doing their very best impression of a giraffe. Mm -hmm. They're very tall. They have long necks, not giraffe long, but fairly long necks. Uh, more like a horse so yeah. like maybe a long-necked horse with a horse-ish looking head at the end of it. Real tall legs, real big bodies, quite long necks. And when I say giant, I don't mean like giant for a rhino. I mean giant for a mammal. Yeah, it's not just like a little bit, you know, a, a rhino plus some. It is massive. Paraceratherium, uh, which is one of the genera in the group, and close relatives are estimated at their largest to have gotten up to 16 feet tall, or 5 meters at the shoulder. At Oof. the shoulder, they were roughly the height of modern-day giraffes. Ugh. And weight estimates are very widely ranging, from 10 tons all the way up to 20 tons. <laughs> These are some of the largest land mammals that have ever existed. They rival the largest elephants. Yes. Huge. This is a group that includes several different species. They lived in Eurasia during the Eocene to the Oligocene roughly 40 to 20 million years ago. Most of them are found in Central Asia, but one of the very best-known species is Paraceratherium bugtiensi from Pakistan, Oh, which is a little bit separated away from the rest, so there has been an open question of how these giant rhinos were moving around. Yeah. This new research identifies a new species... That helps to add a piece to the puzzle. The new species is Paraceratherium linshaensi from northwestern China along the northern side of the Tibetan Plateau. It comes from a time period around 26.5 million years ago during the Oligocene alongside creodonts, calicotheres, and telodonts, and more. The researchers discovered a skull that is 3.8 feet long... <laughs> So over a meter, Ugh. making it apparently among the largest Paraceratherium. I mean, yeah, I'd hope so. <laughs> uh, it's got a bunch of unique features uh, that suggest it is a new species, including evidence of a particularly long neck. We don't know how long, but a uh, strong neck attachment muscle area, if I read correctly. It seems to be closely related to another Central Asian species, Paraceratherium lepidum, and those two together are very close to Bugtiensi, the one from Pakistan. Mm. So this suggests, given that these are close in time to the Pakistan rhinos and close in their evolutionary relationship, that they might give us a clue to the path that the rhinos took out of Asia. 
specifically because these two are found near Tibet, they might have traveled through Tibet to disperse towards Pakistan. Yeah. At that time, there's evidence that the Tibetan plateau, at least in some regions, would have been lower in elevation and had open environments. So before it reached its current height and uh, environment, these rhinos would have been able to travel through that region to disperse into the India-Pakistan area. Cool. Altogether, these add to a growing picture of fossil remains of the giant rhinos that seem to track their possible evo- uh, a pathway through space and time that they may have started in Mongolia, up in the Mongolian Plateau, move down into China, and from there through Tibet towards Pakistan, specializing at each place and developing into new species. Nice. It's always super interesting when we can track the path of a, a, a group as they spread or move through a landmass or from one landmass to another. I don't know, it's just it, it's like picking up the fossil breadcrumbs just over the ages. Yeah. And I, I find that fascinating. And somehow um, it's even cooler when it's giant rhinos. Yes. Also, I realized, I don't, I don't think we said when we were describing how they're different than rhinos, uh, all the reconstructions I ever see don't have horns. Oh, yeah, that's true. <laughs> I, I don't know that there's any evidence of horns yeah. on these guys. I just realized. That's we... a very good point. <laughs> they weren't like holding their horns 20 feet off the ground. Yep. <laughs> to fight off the buzzards. <laughs> yeah, I just realized that was like the one no, big thing that that's... everyone thinks of when you say rhino we that's didn't say. <laughs> an excellent point. <laughs> Who needs a horn when you can just step on everything? Yeah, when you're a giraffe plus some. <laughs> well, speaking of giant extinct animals, Ooh. my new my next news talks about the medium-sized young of giant extinct animals. Oh, well, let's hear about it. This is research that we've mentioned something that dealt with this concept before. Very recently. In another news, this research furthers that concept that the young of tyrannosaurs were replacing medium-sized predators in their environments. Very cool. This is research by Thomas Holtz, Tom Holtz, in the Canadian Journal of Earth Sciences, and the article is a press release in phys.org by the University of Maryland. So, as I said, in another news, we've discussed this briefly. Yeah, there have been some news items recently that have found various forms of evidence to suggest that when tyrannosaurs, being giant predators, were young, their young middle-sized versions filled in the ecological niches of middle-sized predators. Which started to be hypothesized long ago when we first started noticing that they were shaped different, that the young had a different body builds. They were more slender, more, as we would say, gracile, mm-hmm. long-limbed, seemed to be better for moving quicker, you know, or, you know, more agile potentially, which started to bring up, all right, maybe they were living differently before they got to be these big giant things you know, thundering monsters. This research seems to confirm that, yes, when giant tyrannosaurs entered an environment, their young replaced the medium-sized predators, and they determined this by looking at the numbers of species in different fossil sites and ages that had tyrannosaurs. Oh. So, Tom Holtz surveyed 60 different dinosaur communities. So, fossil sites of dinosaurs living together at the same age, from the Jurassic and Cretaceous, so between 266 million years, and counted the number of carnivorous species in each community, and then sorted them into sizes. Medium-sized dinosaurs, which were 50 to 1,000 kilograms, and large category, for which were the ones exceeding 1,000 kilograms. Right. Anything above that. The real big boys. The big ones. This analysis revealed that in... 31 of the communities where tyrannosaurs were not the largest predators, there was a wide range of medium-sized predators. Okay. So if the T-Rex, if the tyrannosaurs weren't the big, you know, head honchos, medium-sized predators did fine. And this is true even in Asia and North America where tyrannosaurs famously get big from the Jurassic up to the beginning of the late Cretaceous. And outside of Asia and North America, this continues up through the late Cretaceous. So if the Tyrannosaurs aren't the biggest, medium-sized predators do fine. In the other 29 communities where Tyrannosaurs were the largest, the medium-sized predators were rare to absent. Mm. 
during the later half of the Cretaceous period when tyr giant tyrannosaurs started becoming a thing. So around 80 to 95 million years ago is when we see those giant tyrannosaurs come into the environments. And when that happens, in those places where it happens, medium-sized predators basically disappear. Now, this does not guarantee that the tyrannosaurs were the ones that caused those medium-sized predators to go extinct. True. Something else could have pushed the medium-sized predators to extinction, and tyrannosaurs took advantage of it. Right. They were able to adapt to fill in that space. Yes. So, to try to answer that question, they next analyzed same communities, but looked at prey species numbers. Okay. Because when you see a dramatic shift in the predator demographic, you typically see some shift in the prey. Makes sense. Either because the, pre the predators became absent, so the prey did great, and their numbers increase, or the prey species dropped, which caused the predator drop, or there was something that caused both of them to drop. So that typically you should see a shift if the predators that are preying on them shift. And what they found was no difference. The prey species seemed to be basically the same, which means something was filling the medium-sized predator role, which seems to indicate that at least the young tyrannosaurs were acting as the medium-sized predators. They were filling that niche in those habitats and is a little bit of support that they may be the reason there were no medium-sized predators. Now, Tom Holtz admits they'll need more evidence. They'll need more specimens from more sites. Right to really confirm that this is what was happening, but they definitely seem like they were filling that niche in those environments and may be the reason that there were no medium-sized predators. It's fascinating because we talk all the time when we're talking about evolutionary paths and, you know, and evolutionary replacements and stuff about species moving into an environment and filling a role, filling mm -hmm. a niche, different organisms competing with each other in the same space, but we rarely consider the thought that a species <laughs> can move into an environment and compete with everything. Yes. <laughs> compete with several different ecological roles. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. Where you are, <laughs> you are growing through the niches yeah <laughs> and so you and, just and winning at every level like you're <laughs> yeah. you're going through all the different classes <laughs> the lightweight middleweight and heavyweight and you're winning every time <laughs> it's just it's just unfair you know it's funny because for many many years right tyrannosaurus rex is named king mm-hmm uh, and people really like latching on to common names. And so often you'll hear T-Rex called the king of the dinosaurs. And I've always thought that that's a little bit silly because there are lots of dinosaurs that are like that. And there are a lot of dinosaurs that are that big. But this really makes a good case for that title. Yeah. That, yeah, you did kind of come in and kick everybody else out. Yeah. No, it maybe it, potentially. Potentially. It really does put in perspective how terrifying giant tyrannosaurs were as <laughs> like if you need a, an example of apex predator right that's this is a pretty good stand like <laughs> i want this next to that term in the dictionary now very cool well speaking of giant extinct animals hey my last bit of news is about giant extinct animals that weren't giant all right you you convince me to be excited sicilian dwarf elephants Okay, I'm good. Yeah, this is research by Sina Baleka et al. in Current Biology, and we'll link to an article on the website of the Natural History Museum of London uh, from where one of the researchers is. Uh, so a press release of sorts by Josh Davis. Sicilian dwarf elephants, as their name implies, were elephants. Mm -hmm. uh, you've heard about them, episode 66. Dwarf, very small for elephants, from the island of Sicily. We've talked uh, numerous times, notably in episode six, about island evolution. And one of the things that often happens on islands is big animals become small. Insular dwarfism. These elephants are known to have lived on the island of Sicily within the last 200,000 years. They are now extinct. They were island dwarves. There are two taxa, two species, kind of, two forms of them. It sounds like the identification is a little wonky two flavors two flavors of sicilian dwarf elephant one of which was two meters tall 
<laughs> six feet to like will or me, my size yeah and the other one was one meter tall whoa a pony sized elephant i hadn't heard about that one real small whoa so tiny <sighs> how <laughs> both of them have been identified within the genus paleoloxodon the straight tusked elephants which if any of you recognize the genus paleoloxodon you might be thinking why that's certainly strange <laughs> because paleoloxodon includes the species that is commonly cited as the largest land animal of all time yep certain paleoloxodon are estimated to get over 20 tons potentially i believe that's based on scant remains yeah but these included some of the largest land animals of all time rivaling those big rhinos yeah it's like definitely some of the biggest elephants potentially some of the biggest land mammals yes and potentially the including the biggest yeah so big big elephants and then these ones little, 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 little tiny little tiny so it's thought that some of the straight tusked elephants made their way to the island when sea level was low and then when sea levels rose they became trapped and then became tiny but not much is known about their evolution or origins of these dwarf elephants. So here, the researchers got a hold of some mitochondrial DNA <gasps> from elephant remains in Puntali Cave, which apparently is a great cave for studying straight test elephants. I want to go to this cave. It seems like a cool cave. The fact that they got mitochondrial DNA is exciting because this is a tropical, warm, wet environment where you don't often get ancient DNA. Hey, well done, team. They pulled it off by going for the petrous bone, which is a bone inside the ear that is super dense with DNA. Yes, I've, he I've heard of this bone. Yeah, we've talked about it before. Famously, that is the bone you want if you're going for DNA. This is further exciting because there's this is the first DNA from Southern European straight test elephants. Mm. Now, the dating on the specimen is a bit uncertain. It is somewhere between 175 to 50,000 years ago. 175,000 to 50,000. Okay. So somewhere within the last 200,000 years, it is the larger of the dwarf elephants. This is the human-sized dwarf elephant as opposed to the Great Dane-sized. Uh, my now second favorite dwarf elephant. <laughs> <laughs> and they compared the DNA with Paleoloxodon antiquus from Germany. And they found that the dwarf elephants seem to have split from those German cousins around 400,000 years ago. In that time, they went from the size, roughly, probably, of Antiquus, which is 3.7 meters tall, so a 12-foot or so tall elephant, and weighing over 10 tons, to these dwarves. Which is big for an elephant. Which is big for an elephant. That's, that's 10 tons is like... Way upper size range of modern elephants. Yes. <laughs> and in that time, they lost almost 85% of their body mass through evolving into these dwarves. It's the Paleoloxodon diet. Yeah. That's <laughs> <laughs> a clever guy. My co-host, some hotshot. <laughs> now, they did a bunch of estimate estimates to try to figure out what was the rate of that evolution, because we don't know very much about the rate of dwarfism on islands. Oh. Now, as you can imagine, because the date of these fossils is kind of uncertain, and because exactly when they got to the island is a bit uncertain, and because exactly what their ancestors' size was, there's a bit of a range of answers in these estimates. But they found that this is clearly very rapid. This is a few hundred thousand years to become 15% of the size you, like one sixth the size you started. And depending on the data they used for these estimates, this dwarfing could have happened in as few as 40 generations. Wow. Now, like I said, there's a range of estimates and that's the upper end. Although there is a quote from one of the authors in the article that says they wouldn't be surprised if some of the estimates are underestimates because of the nature of the data they're using. So... Yeah, they're being overly cautious. Right. Preliminary results, but insights into the rate of evolution of shrinking elephants potentially faster than you would expect. 
God. Also, at the high end of their estimates, uh, they found that if this happened at the fastest estimated rate, these elephants could have been losing up to 200 kilograms per generation. (laughs) Just having real small babies, and those are the ones that make it. Yeah. Wow. I love everything about this news so much. (laughs) The concept of the rate of dwarfism is fascinating how right? what it how fast do things shrink that's amazing and just yeah the question of how because that that is extreme dwarfism oh yeah like that's it's not like oh yeah you got you're down to like two-thirds of your original size yeah, or something usually when we say dwarfism it's like if it's you know like a dwarf def- you're half the size woof like right. oh man yeah that's a lot this is almost unrecognizable they made a comparison in both the paper and the article that this would be like humans uh giving rise to descendants the size of rhesus macaques yeah exactly yeah like that's this is so insane and like a meter tall animal is not a small animal no no that's a good sized animal that's a good sized animal it's a very small elephant (laughs) so i just i want to know so much more now I go to Italy. I would. I would. We need to. Uh, so patrons <laughs> <laughs> start putting money into the San De- David and Will to Italy fund. Cool. The better shout out is: Hey, if you study elephants, go to Sicily and learn more about this, so that we can learn about it and, and invite us there to interview. Oh yeah! Oh yeah! Do that. That's better than what I said. <laughs> well. Speaking of giant extinct animals... Now we're going to continue. Shall we move on to our main topic? Let's shall. We're going to talk about ichthyosaurs, their origins, their evolution, their unique traits, their extinction, and everything in between after this break. For most of the last 250 million years, the oceans have been dominated, in part, alongside fish and sharks and stuff, by secondarily aquatic vertebrates. Mm -hmm. That is, bony animals that evolved to be ocean-dwelling from land-dwelling ancestors. In the Cenozoic era, the age of mammals, the dominant examples are cetaceans, whales and dolphins, episode 41, And along with them, we've got pinnipeds, seal, sea lions, and walruses, episode 104, and then other things like uh, sirenians, manatees, Mm -hmm. things like that. Back in the Mesozoic era, the age of reptiles, the ones who were doing it were reptiles. And of the many, many groups that evolved to be secondarily aquatic in the Mesozoic, there were three that are the big, famous, well-studied, well-known, very diverse marine reptile groups, mosasaurs, the aquatic lizards of the late Cretaceous, which were the topic of episode 51, plesiosaurs, which existed much longer than mosasaurs and are famous for their Loch Ness monster-shaped examples, but were more diverse than that, which were the topic of episode 72, and ichthyosaurs, the ones shaped like fish. Or at least they're famous for being shaped like fish, and indeed they're named for being shaped like fish. Yeah. Ichthyosaur, like ichthyology. Ichthyosaurs are unique among the Mesozoic marine reptiles for a lot of reasons. Predominantly, they did it first. Yeah. (laughs) They showed up way earlier than Mosasaurs or Plesiosaurs. In fact, they were some of the very first marine reptiles to ever evolve. We're going to talk a lot about what makes Ichthyosaurs cool, but here are some claims to fame to whet your appetite. They were the first large marine predators among tetrapods and the first giant marine predators among vertebrates. Wow. Fun fact, they also included the largest eyes of vertebrates. Oh yeah, I forget about that. Yeah, they had giant eyes. Yeah. We'll talk more about that later. Adorable. And they are among the most diverse and successful aquatic tetrapods. I have seen multiple sources while I was going through uh, research about them that called them the most highly adapted aquatic reptiles. And at least one source that straight up just said the most highly adapted aquatic amniotes. Wow. The most aquatic. (laughs) Yes, exactly. They, They are often compared to cetaceans. 
like their degree of evolution into aquatic adaptation is matched only perhaps by whales. Wow. Very cool animals. Now, what strikes me as interesting about ichthyosaurs, as I was, you know, learning about them and, and refreshing my understanding of them, I kind you know, it's it's not a f- total coincidence that ichthyosaurs are the third of these groups that we're doing, because I feel like they're easy to overlook. Absolutely. At least for me. Like, if you were to ask me, especially before I did uh, research for this episode... Which are the interesting ones? Well, mosasaurs, obviously. They're squamates. <laughs> but yeah, for I guess I hadn't realized before this that ichthyosaurs, I, I kind of had thought of them as less exciting. Yeah. No, I, I, would, I would not disagree. Yeah, I, and I don't, I don't think I re- recognized that until I was doing this, and I was surprised by all the things I was learning about them that are super cool. And I wonder if that's partially because they are a very familiar shape. Yep. I mean, that that fish shape, which they weren't all fish shaped, but that seems very classic. But also, I suspect that part of it has to do with how famous ichthyosaurs are. Oh, well, yeah. Ichthyosaurs have a bit of the dinosaur situation where the first famous ichthyosaurs are some of the first famous fossils, period. They have been studied and well known since the early 1800s. Yeah. And there's tons of really cool examples, cool fossils of ichthyosaurs that preserve all sorts of cool features, which has meant that they're the go-to example for, like, kids' books and textbooks. Mm -hmm. So I feel like I see them all the time. I feel like their fame has kind of made them seem typical or or sort of uh, expected. Or that they've become the standard you know, the, the go-to cliche almost. Right. Like, yeah, everyone knows Triceratops. Mm-hmm. You hear Triceratops all the time. Yeah, everyone knows Ichthyosaurs. You hear about, oh, they're in all the books. Well, I know part of what gave them that reputation for me is that they famously have those long, thin, hydrodynamic snouts mm-hmm. and mouths. And long, thin snouts typically are associated with, you know, being good for catching fish, but not much else. Sure, sure. Uh, which, it, you know, that's fine and all. There's nothing wrong with that. But for me personally, I like, the predators that take down bigger stuff because that's right. what I'm interested in. Mosasaurs are sea monsters. Yeah. So they're cooler. And like, even though the long necked plesiosaurs also are specialized for taking other fish, they're weird. Yeah. So I was interested in that. Uh, but now I feel, I, I should feel guilty for that because that's also the reputation that was heaped on the false gharial and they eat monkeys and stuff. Yeah. So. Well, ichthyosaurs just, in my head, they seemed basic. Mm-hmm. Which they're not. That is not true. They're not generalist eaters, and they're not all just fish-shaped, and they're not just uh, some normal bit. They're super cool. Their history is awesome. And indeed, that's part of why they've been so famous. The ichthyosaur fossil record spans all the way from the earliest Triassic, almost 250 million years ago, to the middle of the Cretaceous. They do not make it to the end Cretaceous. They so disappear around 90 million years ago. They are found all over the world at much of the different time periods that they existed in. They're found uh, in marine sediments, ocean sediments, t- typically not in shallow waters. They are found in open waters. All right. And they are predators. As far as we can tell, exclusively predators. Like a lot of ocean animals like a lot of marine reptiles oh, yeah, like cetaceans <laughs> exactly like cetaceans like mosasaurs like plesiosaurs there are many very famous fossil sites for ichthyosaurs many that go back 200 years almost in their uh, study holtzmaden in germany lime regis in england which we've talked about before fossil hill in nevada a few of these sites are known for abundant and exceptional Fossil remains of ichthyosaurs, including some of the most famous ichthyosaurs known from complete remains, Ichthyosaurus and Stenopterygius, whose uh, remains include full skeletons, soft tissue evidence, gut contents, and there are a surprising number of pregnant fossil ichthyosaurs. Cool. They also are historically famous, not only because they're, they come from historical sites, but Mary Anning... Like her mascot yep. is the ichthyosaur. We talked about Mary Anning in episode 80, very famous pioneering paleontologist. 
her first famous find, along with her brother, when she was, I think, 12 or so, was a complete skeleton of an ichthyosaur. And then later she found several other ichthyosaurs. Because one wasn't enough. Because one, oh, she wasn't satisfied. Uh, which at the time, I believe, were identified as ichthyosaurus, the genus, but at least some of them have been re-identified as temnodontosaurus. Oh. Uh, early Jurassic species. And in 2015, very recently, a study identified a new species of ichthyosaurus from England and named it after her. Ichthyosaurus aningae. About time. Right? <laughs> it took you long enough. Paleontology as a whole. Yep. That specimen actually has a really interesting story because it was uh, discovered in England, uh, came into the possession of the museum, and then at some point got ended up being mistaken for a plaster cast <laughs> of itself, I guess, and then was used at like a plaster cast for a while <laughs> until paleontologists went, mm, that's, no, that's a fossil. Yep. Also, it's a new species. <laughs> oh, my, my blood pressure. <laughs> yeah, it's, I don't know much details because I only came upon it in passing, but yeah. So ichthyosaurs are part of the history of paleontology in, in a way that like dinosaurs are part of the history that a lot of other ancient groups aren't so much you know, historically famous in that way. Yeah, these are defining to the early days of this scientific field. Yeah. So let's talk a bit about what makes ichthyosaurs unique and special in their anatomy. The overriding feature is that ichthyosaurs are specialized for living in the water. They have a lot of the same features that we see in our other aquatic uh, organisms. They have hydrodynamic bodies. They have flippers. Their arms and legs are uh, adapted into paddle-shaped mm -hmm. flippers. Unlike some others, ichthyosaurs tend to have smaller heads. So as opposed to when you think of whales or mosasaurs or pliosaurs, ichthyosaurs did not get the giant monster heads that some other groups did. But as I said, their bodies were not always fish-shaped. Early ichthyosaurs especially were often long and slender, with long, straight tails. And at least in some cases, there's evidence of the spines on the vertebrae of the tails being a bit higher mm. to create that sort of tall, flat... Uh, sort of, if you think of like a croc's tail, is kind yeah. of tall and flat. These early, long, slender ichthyosaurs are thought to have swum using what's called anguilliform locomotion, mm -hmm. which means eel-like. They undulated their whole body. Yeah. Right. That the way sea snakes swim, that whole, your whole body is creating propulsion to move you through the water. As ichthyosaur evolution progressed, we started to see more and more fish-shaped bodies. Shorter bodies, a uh, fusiform, which is to say tapering at both ends. Mm -hmm. So like a football or like think of a generic fish mm -hmm. and it's pointy at one end and pointy at the other end and then there's a tail and these more fish-shaped ichthyosaurs had tall tail flukes so the tail if you think of like a shark's tail has a lobe that goes up and a lobe that goes down ichthyosaurs the very fish-shaped ichthyosaurs had tails like that and these uh probably uh, used a form of swimming called thuniform like tuna <laughs> getting propulsion from the tail uh which is often associated that this body shape with high speed and high efficiency swimming yeah we see this in tuna a bunch of other fish we see this in some of the most uh exciting predatory sharks yeah dolphins are like this this is a repeated pattern in aquatic evolution you have this little bullet of a body that's mm -hmm. hydrodynamic and then this powerful motor of a tail yeah. that just propels you through the water. Yeah. And then those flippers are there for steering. Mm -hmm. I don't think ichthyosaurs, I didn't see anything about ichthyosaurs using their flippers for propulsion. And at least one reference I saw suggested they were really just there for steering. That's always the way I've seen it portrayed. And that's like what sharks do, mm -hmm. uh, dolphins, you know, these animals are using their tails. Speaking of tails... It is very common among ichthyosaurs to have a feature called a tail bend. One word, tail bend. There is a 
chunk of tail, a few vertebrae toward the end of the tail that are wedge shaped that creates a little kink in the tail. Oh, that's how it's created. That create that, that point makes the tail bend down a little bit. In early ichthyosaurs, especially the ones with the straighter tails, this kink can be as low as 10 degrees of, of change of direction, in which case it's called a caudal peak. Mm -hmm. And there is soft tissue evidence of impressions of the body around the skeletons of a little fluke that would have ro risen above that caudal peak. A little triangular peak. Just a little nubbin. In the soft tissue to help them get a little bit of extra propulsive surface. Later ichthyosaurs, the tail bend could be as uh, as dramatic as 40 degrees, supporting the bottom of the vertical tail flukes. Yeah, so if you're thinking like a shark tail, and you were to draw a line of the shark's spine, but then continue it into the bottom fin of their tail. Yes. So ichthyosaurs, their vertebrae go down into the bottom part of the tail, which we also, I believe, discussed for mosasaurs. Yep. And I think that's also how the marine crocs that have oh, yeah, I fin think tails right. also have that same setup. Yeah. This is a not uncommon circumstance. <laughs> if you're a swimming reptile, it's a good way to make a tail fluke. Good way to do it. We have a number of fossil specimens that show skin impressions that give us a sense of the body shape. Those are where we get evidence of these tail flukes. Also, in some ichthyosaurs, dorsal fins. Yeah. Like dolphins, like a, a lot of whales, like a lot of fish. Fins along the middle of the back. So while later ichthyosaurs especially had that very fish or dolphin-like body, early ones looked much more slender. They look a lot like mosasaurs. Yeah, which is with really skinny faces. Yeah, superficially. Now, I say they look like mosasaurs. They look like many marine reptiles when they first go into the ocean. Yeah. That's a common body shape. They look a bit like crocs with flippers. <laughs> As I was like, saying, you, you have a long face, you have webbed or paddle-like limbs, and a long, flattened tail. Yeah, that's, that's being a reptile in the water. Yep, that's <laughs> how it works. In terms of body size, ichthyosaurs come in a wide range. In fact, if you think about cetaceans, whales and dolphins, ichthyosaurs basically cover that whole spectrum. Oof. The smallest ichthyosaurs could be under one meter long, Aww. so just a couple of feet long. And there are big ones that got up to the size of sperm whales, <laughs> which, as a reminder, are the largest macro predators in the world today. And some ichthyosaurs seem to have gotten even larger than that. <sighs> More on that later. Also, for the tiny ichthyosaurs, I want those back in, in the aquariums now. Oh, yeah, they'd be real cute. That'd be so cool. Oh, man. I was reading one uh, paper that suggested... I don't see any... There wasn't, like, a, an analysis about this. It was just an offhand comment that said because ichthyosaur noses, their nostrils are in front of their eyes, that they probably breached sideways. Oh. That when they came up to breathe. So like dolphins and whales, when they come up to breathe, their nose is on their back. Mm -hmm. So they just stick their back out of the water. But these, it was in front of the eye, so they would have had to turn their head and stick a nostril out of the water. That makes more, because like I've seen, uh, uh, Walking with Dinosaurs had an ichthyosaur episode and they just showed them sticking their face out. Yeah. That makes more sense. Yeah. Because then you don't have to stick your whole yeah. snout out of the water. Huh. Speaking of skulls, ichthyosaurs tended to have, like I said, relatively small skulls, not giant. Short necks. In fact, short vertebrae. Like, weird. Ichthyosaur vertebrae are very strangely shaped. And in fact, they are a lot like fish. <laughs> ichthyosaur snouts, famously, many times were long and slender. So like a dolphin or like a, a lot of fish. I was going to say, it makes me think of gars. Yeah, like gars. That's what I always think of when I see a, a ichthyosaur face. But they weren't always like that. Uh, some ichthyosaurs had much shorter, blunter snouts that would have looked a lot more like, again, like more typical when you think of marine reptiles, mm -hmm. more like mosasaurs or pliosaur snouts. Mm. Ichthyosaur teeth were usually socketed and came in a whole variety of shapes. Long, slender teeth like in your temistamine crocs, mm -hmm. like in, you know, the cone-shaped teeth. But there were also sharp-toothed ichthyosaurs, round-toothed ichthyosaurs. More on that later, too. 
And, very famously, ichthyosaurs had honkin' big eyes. <laughs> they had very well-developed sclerotic rings. We've talked about these in some other episodes. This is a ring of bone in the eye socket that supports the eyeball. Birds have this. Lots of dinosaurs have it. Lots of extinct reptiles have it. Ichthyosaurs had it. And in some cases, the eyes were so big, in fact, in many cases, the orbit, the, the eye socket in the skull is so big that it changes the shape of the bones around it. This is like when you're making a character in an RPG and you're just <laughs> doing all the dials to just deform the face of your character. That's what they did. They dialed the eyes up all the way and deshaped the skull. Yeah. And then they left it there. The bones of ichthyosaur skulls can be recognized because they're messed up by how big their eyes are. <laughs> In some cases, the eyes can take up more than half the space of the skull behind the mouth. Wow. Just huge eyes. What were you looking at so hard, Ichthyosaurus? Oh, oh, we'll talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> no, there's more. This is the teaser section. <laughs> yeah, I'm so excited. But when people say that Ichthyosaurs are extremely adapted for aquatic environments, they are talking about their bodies, they're talking about their swimming behavior, but they are especially talking about their flippers. Ye. Ichthyosaur limbs, arms, legs, feet, hands are so weird. I was thrown off by this when I, when I wait, just, just you wait. <laughs> Ichthyosaurs had four flippers, front and back, arms and legs. Sometimes they were the same size. Uh, oftentimes the hind flippers were smaller. I didn't find any reference to any examples of ichthyosaurs losing the hind flippers like we see in whales and dolphins. It's what we would have gotten if they had made it to the end of the Cretaceous. That's right. <laughs> like many other secondarily aquatic animals, the flippers are stiff, flattened, paddle-shaped, like whales, like sea turtles. They are, as I've read them called, among the most highly modified tetrapod limbs ever. Oh, 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 right then. A statement like that includes wings and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it does. <laughs> so, imagine, if you will, an arm. Uh, you probably have one or two handy. I'll do my best. Your arm is broken into segments. The upper segment is the stylopodium. That's your humerus bone. Past the elbow is your zygopodium, radius and ulna. In the leg, it's the femur and the stylopodium. And then fibia tibula is your zygopodium. Mesopodium wrist or ankle bones, carpals and tarsals, metapodium, which is the bones of the hand that go from the wrist to the fingers, or from ankle to toes, and then phalanges, which are the bones in your fingers and toes. And indeed, if you look at your fingers, you will see that you have three bones in each of your fingers, except your thumb, which has two. Your arms and legs are a series of specialized bones and specialized segments. Now, if you look at the flippers of whales and mosasaurs and sea turtles, you will see that they have adjusted that shape. The upper arm bones, humerus, radius, ulna, tend to be very short and stocky, and the hand and finger bones tend to be very long. So almost like bats. Yep. Right? They're supporting this long flipper. Early ichthyosaurs looked like that. They had sort you know, somewhat whale or, or sea turtle-like arms. But over time... Their arms got super weird. One of the ways they got weird is a phenomenon that delightfully in one paper that I read was called loss of element identity. The, the just, okay. The humerus and femur, the upper arm or leg bones in the flippers, tended to look like a short stocky humerus or femur. And then after that, in later ichthyosaurs, it's just a mess of bones that all look the same. I'm going to show Will a picture. <laughs> I'm nervous. In, oh, I have seen pictures of that. In later ichthyosaurs, the flippers look like a humerus up top and then just a cobblestone street of a collection of round or polygon shaped bones. The radius, the ulna, the wrist bones, the hand bones, the finger bones all start to look the same. And, and like, in the early ones, you can follow, because they still have, like, lots of little digit bones. Yeah. But you can follow them in the digits. Like, you can see where fingers 
would have been. Yeah, they're and, almost recognizable. Yeah, you got rows, you got nice little columns of bones, and then it just becomes <laughs> it becomes more like a hatch pattern. Yeah, of and bones. then it's just a mess. Yeah, and not only do the bones take on very similar shapes, even the structure of the bones starts to all look the same. Like the structure of the inner and outer bone of your upper arm bones is different from your hand bones, and they all start to look the same. It's a humerus or femur and then just a collection of cobbles all the way down. Which is like, how how can that structurally, how is that helpful? Yeah, you're just making a paddle made of repeated elements on the inside. Yeah, (laughs) what it looks like, I finally figured out what it was making me think of. It looks, if anyone here is it, listening is familiar with 3D printing, mm-hmm. when you make a 3D object, you know, in the computer and then tell the printer to print it, typically you don't print it fully filled, solid, because right. that will waste a lot of material. You print it with an infill pattern that the computer will just say, all right, how thick do you want your walls to be? And you'll say this many millimeters. And then it goes, okay, all the empty space, we're just going to fill with a repeated hexagonal pattern. So that structurally it's strong, it won't crumble like a hollow egg, but we're going to use so little material it basically doesn't matter. That's what their fins look like. It looks like you told the computer, all right, here's the shape of my fin. Now just fill it in. Fill it with stones. Fill it with the shapes I need to (laughs) have enough mass, and then I will use that. Yeah, they've got all of this almost disorganized looking at points, assortment of very samey bones. It's like they're aiming back for the fish condition of having just rays, just collections of simple bones to support a flipper. Yeah, it's it's such a bizarre, like that's such a good way to describe it because that's such a bizarre form of convergent evolution. Yeah. That it's not just the shape, but the internal structure seems to be also yeah, they're, they're leaning like, that way. Fish knew what they were doing. Let's just make our bones like that again. Yeah, just chaos, right? Weird. <laughs> Now, you said when you saw those that in the early forms you could still, looks like you could still identify the digits. The fun thing is that there are digits, still recognizable digits in these flippers, but that brings me to the other things that ichthyosaurs are famous for having done with their arms, hyperdactyly (laughs) and hyperphalange. (laughs) Hyperdactyly means extra digits. God. Now, we talked back in episode 77 about how in the early days of tetrapod evolution, right, fish, the fish that that gave rise to tetrapods, had bones supporting the fins, but then just a bunch of rays out at the ends of those bones. So just a bunch of bony rays just to give shape to the fin. And then as tetrapods evolved, they condensed and specialized those bones into fingers. Mm -hmm. And in the early days, there were tetrapods with eight fingers and seven fingers until it narrowed down to the five that most tetrapods tend to still have today, five or fewer. Mm -hmm. We've just been narrowing since then. Ichthyosaurs add more. Which you're not supposed to do. Which you're not supposed to do. They add extra digits either by bifurcating, which is to say they split a finger, or adding accessory digits. So just having an extra digit pop up next to you. Now, polydactyly is not unheard of. Uh, We see that, you know, humans get that sometimes. Yeah. It will grow an extra toe or an extra finger. But one reference I read, now that this reference is 20 years old now, so this might not still be completely true, but one reference said that this is the only example among amniotes, reptiles, mammals, and birds, of non-pathological polydactyly. Yeah, so not just you were born accidentally having, you know, your species does not typically have that extra toe. This was selected for. Yeah, there was evolutionary pressures to add toes and fingers. Yep. Now, while doing research on some ichthyosaur relatives, I found a suggestion that there are some relatives that might also have been polydactyly. Mm, Okay. So they might not just be ichthyosaurs. But... Ichthyosaurs would get extra digits and not just a couple. The record holder, as I've seen referenced in a couple of different places, was a genus named Capulisaurus, which is known to have had 10 digits <laughs> in 
each of its flippers. <sighs> That's so many. It's and it's just a mitt. Oh, just a big mitt of a flipper. But then there's also hyperphalange, extra phalanges. So again, if you look at your finger, your finger bends in two places past the after your hand because you have three bones in it. Yep. It is not unusual in aquatic animals to add additional phalanges to lengthen the the finger. Yeah, stretch it out instead of making longer bones. Right. You add more bones. Ichthyosaurs are famous for doing this, just adding more, just long rows of round bones, like a string of pearls. <laughs> and again, the record holder, some species of Ichthyosaurus have digits with up to 20 phalanges. <laughs> Six times more phalanges than we have. Now, they were not using their digits as little individual fingers. But I just want you to picture a finger with 19 bins in it. Yep. That's a Tim Burton <laughs> finger right there. And that's just, and, and with 10 of them, 10 of them. So now when you oh. look at that picture, I will find a picture like this, hopefully to yes. put in the blog. I don't know if this picture is open access, but if it's not in the blog post, go look it up. Yeah. And I can see you the can fingers. See I feel like I'm understanding the painting <laughs> of a madman. I there can see the fingers. rows in there. It's just that. All the bones look the same, and there's way too many of them. I'm not happy about any of this, and I love it. <laughs> now, uh, they did not only expand their arms or legs, they also reduced them, uh, particularly in the hind limbs. Because why not? There were some uh, that reduced the number of digits uh, as as far down as to three or two. Wow. So some just had two digits for, I guess, a narrow flipper. Although, skin impressions show that Flippers often extended well beyond the bony parts. Okay. So the bony parts were just the core of the flipper and their actual flippers would have been much longer. Interesting. Because it's looking at the picture, when you see a picture of the bones, it already has a paddle shape. Yeah. Like it's shaped very much. Well, like when you see a sea turtle fin, it's shaped very much in that sort of wing, sort of blade way. So the idea that there could then be a good bit of yeah. soft tissue past that. Like, were there flying ichthyosaurs that <laughs> jumped out of the water like flying fish? Yes. <laughs> Just grabbing pterosaurs out of the sky. <laughs> so ichthyosaurs are highly adapted for aquatic life. They did things that no other group did to achieve aquatic dominance some might say too adapted too, they went too far <laughs> they, they swam too deep and deep, really. <laughs> but of course they did not start out that way let's talk a bit about ichthyosaur evolution starting with where they came from ichthyosaurs are highly specialized which means they have a lot of features of their bodies that make them very different from a lot of other organisms which if you remember our discussions about Bats or turtles or a whole bunch of other things, pterosaurs, you can probably guess that that means we don't know where ichthyosaurs came from. Oh no! They're so different that it makes it very difficult to compare them with other organisms. And the earliest ichthyosaurs we have in the fossil record are pretty ichthyosaur Yeah. Already. We don't have the nice transition from land to water like we do with whales or like we do... Well, this is awkward. <laughs> well, so the re I, I was going to say our horses as another example, but I realized I said land to water, uh, which doesn't apply to horses. So I was like, oh, I'll just think of another... Hmm. Hmm. No. A nice early transition like we have for whales or for horses <laughs> or for, you know, like dinosaurs or a bunch of other groups. Yeah. Ichthyosaurs are very ichthyosaur-like from the start. So over time, there have been many suggestions of where on the reptile family tree they might fall. They have been suggested as uh, to be included among the anapsids, which is a group that seems to just keep getting things taken away from it. Yeah, That's where right. turtles were for a while. Yep. yep. <laughs> uh, possibly close to mesosaurs, another group of aquatic reptiles. There was apparently at some point even the suggestion that they might have been amphibians, <laughs> like that they may have come from, like, labyrinthodonts, <laughs> well, Paleozoic amphibians. Aren't they weird enough? <laughs> <laughs> but these days, most research seems to suggest that they are 
basal diapsids. Okay. So diapsids is a group that includes most reptiles, especially familiar reptiles. Ichthyosaurs are an early branch off of major reptile groups. Which would make sense considering how weird and different they are compared to other reptiles we know. Right. That if they branched off very early, they would not have acquired many of the recognizable diapsid things right. and could get really weird early on. So they're, a brand, they're, they're like the platypuses of reptiles. Yeah. They're just very strange. But they are not alone on their uh, weird trajectory. The Ichthyosauromorpha is a group that includes ichthyosaurs and some close relatives. What? There's a Morpha? There's a Morpha. Oh. Next to the ichthyosaurs are a group called Hupesuchians. There are several genera. Uh, they're all known from Hubei in South China. Oh, that's right. From the early Triassic, these are marine reptiles. They look a bit like ichthyosaurs. Paddle limbs, fusiform, sort of fish-shaped bodies, long neural spines to give them high tails and such for spinning, swimming around. One reference said possibly polydactyl, mm. maybe extra digits. So maybe it wasn't just the ichthyosaurs. So these are very ichthyosaur-like animals that were close to ichthyosaurs. And then there is a small group for now known as narrow rostra, mm -hmm. which are even closer to ichthyosaurs, a very close group. There are two species, both from the same part of the world, that have been discovered in the last seven years. Wow. These come from the Majiashan Quarry in Anhui, China. These are early Triassic. The first, identified in 2014, is Carterhynchus, which is a very small animal, estimated full length only 40 centimeters. Woo. So a little over a foot. Body is short, not lengthy and, and serpentine, but with very large flippers. And the overall shape of their body and their heavier bones led authors to suggest that they might have been good in shallow waters. And their flippers appear to be somewhat mobile, like seals. Oh! So they might have been amphibious. <gasps> Maybe able to go in and out of the water. Spinning plates on their nose instead of balancing balls. Exactly. And the other uh, group within this group is Sclerocormus. Identified in 2016 from the same place, very similar to Carterhynchus, but significantly larger, uh, estimated to have been 160 centimeters long. So, so a meter and a half. Yeah. Uh, four or five feet long. These seem to be the closest relatives of the ichthyosaur line proper, and maybe a indication of what early ichthyosaurs were like. That's so different than what I. Would have pictured. Yeah. Oh, I, I, I know I'm jumping way into the deep end of the speculative, but seal ichthyosaurs makes me so happy. Yeah. Oh, man. I, it's all I'm going to be thinking about for the next few days. <laughs> ichthyosaurs proper, ichthyosaurs and their like ichthyosaur relative uh, ancestors get started around 248 million years ago. The... Very early Triassic. Yeah, right up there. Right after the Permian extinction, episode 45. <laughs> Everyone's dead. Let's get weird. Let's get weird. The earliest ones are rather small, which is pretty common. Yep. They're one meter, one and a half meters long, not particularly large. Uh, often described as being generalists in terms of their diet and lifestyle. And then they quickly diversify into a variety of body shapes, a variety of feeding styles, they end up all over the planet very quickly. This is a rapid diversification, not just in terms of body styles and lifestyles and feeding, but also in terms of size. Mm -hmm. A 2013 paper described a new species called Thalatoarchon sorophagus. <laughs> all right, then. Yeah. From the very early Middle Triassic, around 244 million years ago in Nevada, which a with a massive skull, flat teeth, like side to side flat with cutting edges, <laughs> kind of shark like, that is estimated to have been about nine meters long, 30 feet. This is an orca sized, right? Orca or great white sized ichthyosaur. It is a 
clearly with those teeth and that size, a macro predator. Yeah, that's eating other big things. Feeding on large prey, which is important today, right? Orcas, big sharks, uh, important through the Mesozoic with the uh, other Mesozoic marine reptiles, but was lacking before this. Oh. Macro predatory verte- amniotes, right? Besides fish and sharks and such. Uh, seemingly did not exist. Oh, yeah. These were among the first, possibly the first, group of land-dwelling animals to give rise to apex predators in the oceans. And and so early and on. And so early. This, this, this species is only four million years after our uh, evidence suggests ichthyosaurs originated, and only six million years after the worst mass extinction event ever. Oof. And that's so big. <laughs> Rapid evolution of apex predators in the oceans. From there, the middle to late Triassic period sees the greatest diversity of ichthyosaurs. This is when ichthyosaurs hit their stride from between 250 to about 200 million years ago. This includes many famous ichthyosaurs like Myxosaurus, which is known from lots of complete skeletons from the Alps, and the Shonisaurids and Shastosaurids, which are well known to have been the largest ichthyosaurs, regularly getting to 10 meters, some well known to get up to 15 meters, and as we will discuss a little later, even bigger than that. God, God, oh. The Triassic period was the heyday of ichthyosaurs, which is super cool because that means that ichthyosaurs had already gotten gigantic in the water when dinosaurs were still barely recognizable on land, and ichthyosaurs had already had their heyday and lost it (laughs) by the time marine crocs and plesiosaurs really got started, but... When the Triassic ends, it's a bad day. Oh. Right? Because episode 15, we discussed the end Triassic mass extinction. At the Triassic-Jurassic boundary, there is a major drop in ichthyosaur diversity. They don't go extinct, but they do seem to be reduced to a handful of lineages that give rise to the rest. We actually see this pattern in a lot of Triassic marine reptiles. Many of them go extinct completely. Ichthyosaurs survive, but by the time we get to the Jurassic now, they seem to have much less diversity in terms of their lifestyles, their feeding styles. Mostly, at this point, we're looking at the tuna-shaped pursuit predator ichthyosaurs. Yeah, which is common whenever we have a mass extinction, and then you have to re-diversify with whoever was left over. A bottleneck. Yep. You went through a genetic bottleneck, Only a few lineages survived. And they happen to be shaped like this. And that's the shape they had. Also potentially limiting their options is that in the Jurassic, while ichthyosaurs are re-diversifying, so are the marine crocs and so are plesiosaurs. But that is not to say that ichthyosaurs just became boring or minor in the Jurassic. They continued to be dominant marine predators throughout the Jurassic. And in fact, some of the most famous ichthyosaurs are Jurassic. Uh, Marianning's ichthyosaurs, right? Ichthyosaurus, Temnodontosaurus, Stenopterygius, uh, which is famous for a lot of the super well-preserved specimens. Ophthalmosaurus, who we will talk about later, is famous for his big honking eyes. (laughs) A lot of famous, very successful ichthyosaurs are found from the Jurassic, but it was just never quite the same yeah. as the Triassic. They never quite reached that level of lifestyle diversity. I, As far as I know, they did never got quite as big ever again. They were important throughout the Jurassic into the Cretaceous period, but they do not make it to the end of the Cretaceous. They don't get all the way to the end of the Mesozoic era. They disappear at the end of the Cenomanian Age around 93 million years ago. The subject of ichthyosaur extinction has been much discussed and much revised in the last decade or so. 
But that's a story for the uh, later in the episode. Yeah, all I'm saying is it seems real suspicious that they bow out right before the asteroid hits. Well, yeah, no, they, they uh, so long and thanks for all the fish. Yeah. Right up out of here. As I say, this seems like some insider <laughs> knowledge going on. But before we talk about ichthyus or extinction, I want to talk about the diversity and cool things we've learned about ichthyus or lifestyles. But before I do that, I want to take a break. Yeah. So go d- use the bathroom or uh, d- make a sandwich, have a glass of milk. Just have an existential crisis over the idea of 10 digits with 20 joints. <sighs> or uh, listen to the music and we'll join you back here in like 15 seconds. <laughs> As I mentioned earlier, ichthyosaurs were predators, Mm -hmm. but they did not all eat the same thing. They had a variety of feeding styles and feeding habits. We know about ichthyosaur diets quite a bit, actually, predominantly from gut contents and teeth. Both good. There are lots of ichthyosaurs with preserved gut contents. In fact, if I remember correctly, that first ichthyosaur that Mary Anning discovered had gut contents. It had fish remains. Within the ribcage. Man, what a show off. Right? She, yeah, she just took all the good ones. <laughs> she was young, right? She, she was still young and braggy then. It's her maverick days. <laughs> uh, go listen to episode 80 and, and then laugh and be sad about this joke. Yeah. Among the gut contents that have been found with ichthyosaurs include remains of fish, at least one specimen with bird and turtle remains. Now, uh, to be clear, and the authors discuss that... It, it, it may not have caught the bird. No, this come on. Don't take been. this from me. The ichthyosaur <laughs> is well known to have left out of the sea like a great white shark and grabbed birds out of the sky. <laughs> well, it's like an archer fish. And you, can... just... <laughs> <laughs> and you can quote us, tell all your ichthyosaur friends that we said that that's absolutely true. Oh, we're going to get a lot of fan mail. <laughs> Smaller ichthyosaur remains. Have been found in the guts. I mean, I'd be surprised (laughs) if they hadn't. (laughs) But the most common and famous remains inside ichthyosaur guts are tiny little hooks. Oh. Well, do you know what animal has tiny little hooks? Could could this be a cephalopod of some sort? Yeah, little squid hooklets. So we've talked about this in the past, that a lot of cephalopods, squid, octopus, etc., have little hooks on their arms Mm -hmm. that are hard. They are, they are made of hard material, so they tend to fossilize when the rest of the body is goo. And that makes perfect sense to be a prey item for ichthyosaurs, with, yeah. especially the long, narrow-snouted ones. And in fact, they are often, have long been interpreted as cephalopod eaters. I mean, what, what better thing to eat uh, cephalopods with than chopsticks? <laughs> Indeed. Uh, there were squid, there were bolemnites, the sort of bullet-shaped squid animals, ammonites with their spirally shells. For more on that, check out episode 16 about cephalopods. But there is even more variety than is indicated by gut contents, which we know from teeth. The classic image of an ichthyosaur is, as you've been describing it, long slender snout with long slender teeth. Yep. And in fact, even in the not slender snouted ichthyosaurs, there are lots of ichthyosaurs with long slender teeth. These are especially good for soft foods and slippery foods like fish and cephalopods. Yeah. We also see that same tooth morphology in a lot of crocodilians. We see it in plesiosaurs. That's real good for catching slippery, squishy stuff. Some ichthyosaurs had larger, sharper teeth more like what you might see in sharks. These are good for large prey. Like I mentioned before, macro predators. Especially we see teeth like this in large, fast-moving ichthyosaurs, the ones that had that very tuna-shaped body that were likely pursuit predators. We also see lots of heterodonty in ichthyosaurs. That's a term uh, that you can go back to episode 88 when we talked about teeth meaning different types of teeth in the same mouth. Really? Especially in the Triassic. Especially early ichthyosaurs tended to have, Will's going to be happy about this one, pointy teeth in the front and rounder, crushy teeth in the back. 
Yay! Yeah. Why are you so happy about that? Because that's what the best animal's <laughs> teeth are like. <laughs> yeah, we see that in gators today, yep. especially. Which suggests that they were able to eat a variety of things. Yeah. Right? But, uh, stabby in the front, crushy in the back. Yeah, which means I can grab something and just swallow it if that's something I can swallow. But if I need to crunch it up a bit, I just toss it to the back of the mouth. Yep. Mixosaurus uh, had that along with many of the earliest ichthyosaurs. Cartorhynchus, the one of the two close relatives to the ichthyosaur line, had heterodont teeth like that. These are interpreted as being generalist feeders. Yeah. You can eat all sorts of stuff. But many ichthyosaurs went fully durophagous. Mm-hmm. All or most of their teeth were round, crushing teeth. Teeth for eating hard stuff. Famously, uh, Omphalosaurus is like this from Triassic, Nevada in Europe. That's a good name for a durophagus ichthyosaur. Om nom nom phallosaurus. <laughs> <laughs> Crushy teeth are great for shelled things, bivalves, if you're crushing up ammonites, uh, maybe early turtles, <laughs> like gators do. But even then, crushy teeth are not all the same. Oh. Over the course of hard shell crunching ichthyosaurs, we see teeth that have uh, the crowns, the top of the teeth, in some are very round, in others they're more ridged. And the size of ichthyosaur rock teeth range from as little as three millimeters across to one centimeter across. Oof. Big honking teeth, probably for different kinds of foods. Yeah. Durophagy seems to have evolved several times in ichthyosaurs and their close cousins. Which, to to me, seems unique. And this is something I may just be ill-informed on, but fully durophagous mouths seems pretty rare, at least to my knowledge of animals... Yeah. An animal with just all pebbles for teeth is not common. Like, you'll see some, that, like, we have, you know, our crushing molars in the back. Mm-hmm. Uh, but that's not our entire mouth. And even among right. mammals that eat tough stuff, that's not, that right. they just only have those teeth usually. Now, some of the very durophagous ichthyosaurs did still have pointy teeth up front. Okay. So there was some degree of heterodonty in at least some of them. I don't know, uh, now that you mention it, if any of them were like, all big round teeth. Like caiman lizard style. Right. But they could have been because, yeah, caiman lizards, uh, some mosasaurs had very, a, a lot of very round teeth. Cool. Some ichthyosaurs had very few or no teeth, had just lost their teeth, which is something that we see in some marine uh, predators today. Mm-hmm. And there were some uh, strange examples, like the early Jurassic ichthyosaur Urinosaurus, whose upper jaw was twice as long as its lower jaw, like a swordfish. It just had a long pointy nose and might have been feeding like a swordfish. Swimming into fish and just flailing about. Yes. Yeah, how about that? (gasps) Oh, I I need so many of these things (laughs) to be true. (laughs) Here's another one that's going to make Will very happy. It's going to make you happy at first, and then it's going to make you uh, sadder. (laughs) One form of feeding that has been discussed at length uh, with ichthyosaurs is suction feeding. So this is a form of feeding where an animal opens its mouth really fast and creates a vacuum and water rushes in. And just pulls the food in with it. Yep. Lots of fish do this. There are whales that do this. Uh, The alternative to suction feeding, that the, the term that is often used is Ram feeding, which sounds way cooler. (laughs) Yes, it Uh, does. All it means is that you move your head and grab the prey. Yes. As opposed to pulling the prey towards you. (laughs) And of course, a lot of animals do a combination. You open the mouth real fast and move forward and you get a little bit of both. Yes. Suction feeding has been suggested in the past for a lot of ichthyosaurs, especially large and toothless species, in part because their mouths look superficially like beaked whales. Hmm. who do this they open their mouths and retract their tongue to create the vacuum cool but a study in 2013 did an analysis of ichthyosaurs and found that for the most part their jaws don't quite look like they're the right shape to create a good suction area and the one hyoid the throat bone uh, system that is known from ichthyosaurs at least at that time did not show any adaptations for being able to do anything like that for suction feeding. Also, suction feeding is particularly good if your food is very slow and sluggish. You're just getting up to it and just 
sucking it right up, and there's not a lot of evidence that ichthyosaurs were living alongside slow, sluggish things, although they could have, we just don't have a lot of evidence for it, it seems. So suction feeding may or may not actually have been something ichthyosaurs could have been doing, so they were likely ram feeding, <laughs> which is to say just grabbing their food. Yeah, it's, it's <laughs> as we've said with other groups, I'd be shocked if there's not a ichthyosaur right that suction feeds sure but it may not have been the trendy thing right there is a uh, and I'll, I'll link this in the blog post but there's an article about this topic that riley black wrote which starts off by basically saying for a long time people have imagined giant ichthyosaurs just slurping up squids <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of interesting ways to get your food, another method of lifestyle, uh, particularly foraging for food, that has often been discussed for ichthyosaurs is diving. Ooh. Deep diving is a common portrayal for ichthyosaurs, largely because of their giant eyes. Of their largely eyes. <laughs> As I mentioned before, ichthyosaurs just often have really big eyes, and big eyes are associated with low-light vision. The sclerotic rings, the uh, rings of bone within the orbit, can help to estimate eyeball size. The largest measured ichthyosaur eyes came from Temnodontosaurus. This was, I want to say, last decade. I don't have the when this paper was. Which was a 9-meter-long ichthyosaur, so orca-sized, whose eyes measured around 25 centimeters. <sighs> so, like... 10 inches, Oof. which is the size of colossal and giant squid eyes. Is that diameter or circumference? Diameter. Diameter? Yes, yes, yes. I'm sorry. Across. Ugh. 25 centimeters. So when people say dinner plate. It's, yep. Yeah. Almost a foot. Yep. You across. could almost fit a ruler in the inside their eyeball. Yeah, that's like a basketball. I actually, I meant to look up how big basketballs are, and I forgot to, because I went, that's like a basketball or like a dodgeball or a bowling ball <sighs> of an eye. And it's been uh, pointed out that bigger ichthyosaurs than that could have even had bigger eyes yeah. than that. Ophthalmosaurus from the Jurassic is named for its eyes. Its eyes are... <laughs> big honking eyes of source. Big honking eyes of source are only 22 centimeters across, but the animal is four meters long. <laughs> so it has the largest eyes for its body size of I, certainly I, ichthyosaurs. I'm picturing that little scared fish from Finding Nemo. <laughs> yes, just like that. Just, just flippers and fin and two giant eyeballs. <laughs> big old eyes. <laughs> This has, Ophthalmosaurus especially, has been the center of discussions about possible diving habits in ichthyosaurs. There are uh, animals today that dive down to deeper waters to get food. Uh, it's a great way to get to avoid the competition, is yes. to just go somewhere most of them can't go. Yes, it's where they can't see. Physics of eyes are pretty straightforward uh, on the simple scale. Bigger eyes means you can see better. Because the bigger your eyes, the more light you can take in, and the more light receptor cells you can fit in the eye. So, there was a 1999 study I found that examined the aperture of ichthyosaur eyes. And they, in fact, used a measure, it was called the F number, or F unit, or something like that, that is basically minimum aperture to estimate how much light they could take in, the same measurement we use for cameras. Yep. Of how much light can you take in. What they found is that many ichthyosaurs had very good low-light vision. Ophthalmosaurus, as the paper described, would have had low-light vision similar to cats. Impressive low-light vision. Yeah, that, that's a good measure. Adding to this uh, evidence, potentially for diving... Uh, ichthyosaurs are also known to have certain bone structures of some of their bones similar to diving animals like whales and elephant seals. And that same study also did a review of pathologies in ichthyosaurs. So damage to the bones, episode 84 for more on that kind of stuff, specifically looking for signs in the bones of caisson disease, 
the bends. Yes, I was so hoping that's what you were going to say. Yep. Diving animals don't usually get the bends because they're adapted to not do that. But if they are forced to surface too quickly, or if, you know, they have to escape something, or if they accidentally do it, they are certainly prone to getting the bends, whereas other animals aren't because they're just not going down that low. Yeah, if you don't dive deep, you can't get the bends. The bends, incidentally, happens when you surface too fast. If the pressure in your body changes too fast, it can cause all sorts of nonsense to go wrong. But yeah, it's while you're under pressure, air bubbles, that, you know, because there's air inside us. But it's under normal atmospheric pressure, so it's not too big bubbles to cause problems. Right. And if you're in your swimming pool or something, yeah. there's not enough pressure to affect you. But the deeper you go, water pressure gets intense and it compresses air bubbles, which means you can have denser air bubbles that are still small and fine. But if you come up too quickly, they expand like little balloons and cause you to be unhappy. Yep. Damage that can even be found in your bones. Oh. And indeed, they found potential evidence of the bends, most frequently in ichthyosaurs that also had the best low light vision. Nice. Which seems to suggest that, yeah, ichthyosaurs might have been diving, at least some of them, that a study also then took, based on the body size and estimated swimming speed for ophthalmosaurus, estimated that they could have dived, dove, down to 600 meters. That's an estimate, but we see a lot of animals that do this today. They dive down deep to go get stuff. One of the most famous animals that does this are sperm whales. I was about to say. Which eat squid. Yep, other cephalopod eaters. <laughs> yeah. Also are often divers. Yeah. Ah, oh, I mean, it makes perfect sense, and... It's cool that there's so many, like such diverse evidence for it. Yeah, there's a bunch of different lines of at least some of them. And Ophthalmosaurus is Jurassic. So again, like I said before, just because they lost a bunch of diversity, Jurassic Ichthyosaurs were still doing cool stuff. Yeah, still no slouches. Speaking of sperm whales, which are, of course, among the largest predators in the world today, let's talk about body size in Ichthyosaurs. Okay. The smallest Ichthyosaurs were around a meter long. We're just, just tiny little, tiny little creatures. Adorable. Large ones, as we've mentioned, often reached 8 meters, 10 meters, right? Great white-sized, orca-sized. But during the late Triassic, there were a number of giants, including genera such as Shastasaurus, Shonisaurus, Himalayasaurus. Now, apparently there's been a lot of shuffling of these names, uh, while I was reading about them, I found a, a number of places that were like, well, now it's Shonisaurus, but it used to be Shastasaurus. And now it's Shastasaurus, but it used to be Shonisaurus. <laughs> and him it's, it's a whole big mess. But those kinds of names, which regularly are, are estimated to have reached the 10 to 15 meter range, we're talking 50 feet, which is, if you'll recall, the size of the largest of Mosasaurs and Plesiosaurs and sharks. Yep. These are getting to the real big sizes among marine animals. If you go looking for the largest ichthyosaur, the name you are most likely to come up across is Shonisaurus sicaniensis from British Columbia in Canada, which is estimated f based on the skeleton when it was in situ in the ground before it was excavated to have been about 21 meters long. That is a 70 foot ichthyosaur. For comparison, bowhead whales and right whales are in that size range and not much is bigger than them. Oh, wow. And then in 2018, a paper was uh, published that described a fragment of a jaw from the United Kingdom that comes from an ichthyosaur and based on just the jaw fragment, it appears to be even bigger. The authors scaled it with a couple other ichthyosaurs, because different ichthyosaurs have different body proportions. Yes, exactly. So depending on who you compare it with changes the size estimate. Yeah, you may just have a big face. And their estimates ranged in estimated total body length of 22 to 26 meters, which is over 80 feet long, which isn't white blue whale sized but it's it's bumping up against it but if you were in the water next to them you wouldn't know the difference nope 
nope, you'd be having just as many heart attacks. <laughs> <laughs> this jaw fragment was, uh, the authors describe, originally mistaken as dinosaur bone. Yeah. Because it's just a giant chunk of bone. Because it's too big. Ichthyosaurs were getting to 70 to 80 feet. So when I said that they occupied the size range of cetaceans, I meant it. Well, and as we've talked about whenever we get into ginormous animals, what were you doing at those sizes? Well, <laughs> one suggestion that has come up, right, the suction feeding yep. uh, was one, but also it's been suggested they might have been filter feeding. I mean, because that's, that's what the biggest animals today yeah. do. But there's no known filter structures. Yeah. There's no evidence of baleen or anything like that. So they might have just been chowing on stuff that they could find. Mm -hmm. Just Im if that's true, if these were 70 to 80 foot, right? 20 to 25 meter long macro predators. Yeah. yeah. Not filter feeder, like actually just chomping on stuff. That doesn't exist today. No. That... Now, granted, sperm whales are real big. Yes. It's not, they're not nothing. But, oh man. I guess you can do that when you live in an ocean that is full of other... Yeah, babies of you. Giant ichthyosaurs. <laughs> <laughs> That's what we need to find out. Where the giant ichthyosaurs lived and all the middle-sized predators. <laughs> <laughs> and it's just... Well, especially because like, anatomically, they are getting to the lengths of the largest whales, but they're not shaped. Like, as you said early on, relative to their body and especially when we think of other marine tetrapods fairly small heads not massive whale heads that yeah. would make sense for filter feeding and stuff like that it's so you're not shaped like other things this size so what are you doing yeah these would have been truly impressive animals i think i, I was i came across something this might have been on wikipedia an offhand mention to at least one ichthyosaur, and I don't think this was one of the really giant ones, that was estimated to have had several meters between its flippers. Yeah, yeah. yeah just, you're very wide, and you're very long. They would have, uh, some of these might have been very deep, mm -hmm. like a whale. Huge. Enormous animals. Those estimates are bigger than what we see for any other marine reptiles. Oh, by far enormous it's 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 such a you know i mean i'm sure there were lots of perils but it's such a different ocean it's so cool oh i love it on the subject of exceptional ichthyosaurs there are as i've mentioned a lot of exceptional specimens of ichthyosaurs and i've already talked about some of the things we've learned from those super well-preserved specimens we've learned about gut contents soft tissue shapes right flukes and dorsal fins but there's a couple other things to note. One is there's been more investigation of those soft tissue remains. So often ichthyosaurs will be preserved with a skeleton and then impressions and remnants of soft tissue around them. Sort of a halo. As an outline. An outline. A couple of studies in 2017 and 2018 examined those soft tissues and reported evidence of biological materials. Oh. Biomarkers, evidence of cell-like structures and collagen-like structures. This is part of the whole big spectrum of proteins and cells and collagen and stuff like that being identified in very ancient animals that is often put under debate. Yeah. Many people are often very skeptical, but they also seem to keep happening and keep coming. And we seem to keep finding stuff like that. We keep finding similar stuff and people are... Very opinionated on what it is. Yes, exactly. <laughs> and and ex very cool finds when true. The 2018 study included evidence of melanophores. Yay. Pigments. This was specifically looking at a specimen of Stenopterygius, which is most of the really famous super specimens are Stenopterygius or Ichthyosaurus. Early Jurassic, the melanophores, these are color-bearing cells, uh, pigment cells. And the evidence suggested that the Stenopterygius was darker on the top, lighter on the bottom. What do you know? Countershaded. <laughs> like a ton of ocean-dwelling creatures. Yeah, like, I mean, it, that it, countershading is so common in things swimming around. Yep. Makes, means that from above, it's hard to see you against the dark sea floor. And from below, it's hard to notice you against the light of the sun. 
Also in that study, they examined close enough to notice layering in the skin impressions and get chemical evidence and found uh, evidence of fatty tissue, of a layer of fatty tissue, which seems very similar to blubber. Oh. A similar structure to what we see in things like whales or even leatherback sea turtles that have extra fatty tissues around their bodies. And indeed, uh, one expert who, uh, I think this was Motani, who was the author of many of the studies I've mentioned, is quoted in an article as saying, that makes sense because often when we find these skin impressions around ichthyosaurs, there's a gap between the edge of the body and the edge of the skeleton. Yeah. That it seems like they were covered in thickened skin. I mean, it, it, it makes sense. That's a very common thing for aquatic tetrapods to evolve because water's cold. It sure is cold. And if you're going down deep. Yep. That's real handy. And this suggests, like you just said, blubber, thicker skin is very helpful for staying warm, which is a point in favor of another thing that has often been brought up for ichthyosaurs, that they were maintaining high temperatures. Yeah. If you have blubber, that helps insulate. Also, the fact that many ichthyosaurs are interpreted as fast swimmers, if not necessarily like top speed super fast, but you can cruise at high speeds suggest high metabolisms if you could dive down deep that suggests you are resistant to the cold water and probably high metabolism to power yourself down and back up there is evidence that ichthyosaurs like many other marine reptiles were likely maintaining high metabolism and high body temperature which we see in a lot of you know there are a lot of sharks that live similar lifestyles that all you know tuna Mm -hmm. do that as well these were high energy animals. Yeah. Uh, once again, the the concept of warm blooded, cold blooded animals is not a black white situation. And animals finding ways to keep themselves relatively warm compared to the water, the the environment around them, is actually fairly common. Yeah. Like lots have done it in lots of different ways. It's yeah. it's not as cut and dry as it's always made to seem in our old intro biology classes. Right. Sometimes it, it works just to be big. Leatherback sea turtles get away with just being big. Just being hefty. And indeed, some ichthyosaurs were a bit large. <laughs> but probably the most famous thing we've learned from exquisitely preserved ichthyosaur specimens is their reproductive habits. Yep. Ichthyosaurs gave live birth. Like many marine reptiles... Uh, they, you know, sea turtles famously return to land to lay eggs, but most marine reptiles don't do that. Uh, mosasaurs, plesiosaurs, uh, most sea snakes mm-hmm. gave live birth. Because as great as the amniotic egg was for us to leave water, it really hinders going back to it. No, no, no. That's not what you want. <laughs> there are numerous specimens of pregnant ichthyosaurs from several different species in the Triassic And the Jurassic. (laughs) We have a lot of pregnant ichthyosaurs. Ichthyosaur (laughs) skeletons with embryos, fetuses still inside them. They're just getting pregnant all over the place. Just all, that's why they were so successful. (laughs) I found one reference, I think this was my 2000 reference, that said that litter size varies from 1 to 11. Wow, that's way more than I would have thought. Wow. a lot of variation. I assume that's smaller ones. Yeah, makes sense. I, I would think. Oof. The classic example that if you've heard about this, you've very likely heard of it, is there is a a specimen, at least one, of Stenopterygius with a fetus sticking partially out of the pelvis. Yep. A bit out between the pelvis. The, The explanation of this that you'll often read, especially in kids' books and textbooks and stuff, is the somewhat tragic, somewhat romantic view that this was a mother ichthyosaur that died and was fossilized in the process of giving birth, that this this new little baby was on its way out, and then they fossilized together. I've seen in several places the suggestion of the much less romantic view that what might be more likely is that this embryo was ready to be born, so it was lined up with the birth canal, and then the ichthyosaur died and filled up with all those decomposition gases, and those pushed the embryo <laughs> toward the canal. 
and then it got buried that way, which is not uh, nearly as not near as, not, as, not as, quite as, as the warm fuzzy story. <laughs> but if either one of those is true, s- still would support for how it would be coming out. Yes, it would, and indeed, most of the time, tail first. Yeah, which is what we see in most aquatic. Uh, 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 secondarily aquatic live bearers. Because the big, big part there about being secondarily aquatic is long time ago your ancestors got rid of your gills. Yeah, and even ichthyosaurs <laughs> did not re-evolve gills. You can have as many fingers as you want, ichthyosaurs. <laughs> you, you didn't get gills back. You're not that crazy. <laughs> so yeah, you have to be born tail first or else the baby will drown in the amount of time it takes to be born. Yes. So you wait until the very last moment to pop the face out, and then very often, like especially with dolphins and whales, the mother immediately shoves the baby to the surface. Yes. Go, Go breathe. breathe. Go. <gasps> Incidentally, the famous Stenopterygius uh, specimen, the baby is headfirst. Mm. Which could be an accident. Yep. That does happen. There are animals today, like it's it's been seen in some whales and sea cows and sea snakes, but it's not the norm. I mean, it happens to us humans. Like a yeah. baby can get turned around and come out wrong in first. Yeah. Or it could be that that's how they gave birth for some reason. It's hard to say. Yeah. But yeah. we're going to do it this way. Most of the time when we see ichthyosaur embryos, they are oriented tail first. Which brings me to a very interesting study. A 2014 discovery, uh, actually this discovery reported 80 new skeletons of a very, very early ichthyosaur named Chauhusaurus from China around 248 million years ago at the very start of ichthyosaurs. In fact, I think Chauhusaurus is one of the ones that isn't always considered within ichthyosaur proper, that it might be just an ichthyosaur ancestor, but gotcha. yeah, ichthyosaur line. One of these specimens has embryos. These are, at least as of that study, the oldest known Mesozoic marine reptile embryos in the fossil record, which makes sense. It's barely in the Mesozoic. <laughs> <laughs> one of the, uh, the, that one specimen has three embryos associated with it. The embryos have giant heads and tiny flippers. <laughs> one of the embryos is outside the body, like a neonate, right? Born. So a baby. The other two are inside the body, right up near the pelvic region, which suggests that this might actually be a case where the mother died while giving birth. Yeah. That one had been born and the other two were ready to be born and then it didn't quite get to it. This uh, specimen is buried in marine sediment, which is good evidence for giving birth at sea even very early on, but both of the embryos inside the body are head first. Oh. Now, like we said before, sometimes that happens by accident. Sometimes that, it, you know, it's just a way that it can happen. But the fact that there's more than one like that in this instance suggests maybe that's just how this ichthyosaur gave birth. And if this very early ichthyosaur gave birth head first, that has some potential implications for the origins of live bearing in ichthyosaurs. Because giving birth head first is what you do when you live on land. Yep. This animal did not live on land. This was an ichthyosaur. Bo- this, this is a marine animal. It is giving birth here in marine sediment. But if these early ichthyosaurs normally gave birth head first, it could be that that is a feature they inherited from their ancestors, which would suggest that they evolved from live-bearing terrestrial reptiles, which is different from how we normally think about aquatic animals that they evolve live birth because it's better for being out in the ocean, that you were an egg layer, and then you started evolving into the ocean and went, well, oh, no, 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 evolutionarily it is beneficial. We are now being selected for giving live birth. Yeah, that you were an egg layer, and then as you were adapting to the water, you probably went through a sea turtle-like phase where you were having to come back and lay eggs still. Right. And then eventually, one of the ancestors got rid of the egg and started giving live birth. This is a potential, right? This is one example. 
potential implication that they were live ber- live bearing first. And in fact, that paper makes the point that we have no conclusive evidence of how any ancient reptiles evolved to give live birth. It could be that they all came from live ber- live bearing terrestrial ancestors. Which also makes sense because even though the a transitional period of crawling back and then eventually you don't crawl back i can't think of the scenario how do you jump from beach laying to just like you can't just slowly scooch down the shoreline uh <laughs> i like, mean i'm sure it could happen you make modifications to you know a lot of terrestrial reptiles have adjusted the way they give birth between egg laying and mm-hmm. and live bearing but but yeah, they're it, they're usually also not transitioning massively between environments. Yes. Of... So yeah, it could be that live bearing reptiles are more likely to make it. I don't actually know the story with sea snakes. Mm-hmm. Most sea snakes uh, are live bearing. I don't know if they evolved from live bearing terrestrial ancestors, which is something we do have. Like, there are t- plenty of live bearing snakes, and there's there's lizards that give live birth and just live on land. So yeah. like. The possibility of them just being live-bearing reptiles that just happened to have evolved that for some reason Mm -hmm. and then started swimming actually makes a lot of sense. Makes a ton of sense. Uh, Yeah, no, that's cool. So ichthyosaurs, we've learned so many cool things about them. There is a lot left that we don't know. These were a diverse, fascinating, really cool group of animals. But alas... They do not exist anymore. Ichthyosaurs, as I mentioned earlier, make it past the Jurassic and into the Cretaceous, but they do not make it all the way to the end. Cretaceous ichthyosaurs have been a very interesting subject of study, especially in the last decade or so. Our understanding of Cretaceous ichthyosaurs has changed dramatically in the last several years. For a long time, it was thought that ichthyosaurs went through a major extinction at the Jurassic-Cretaceous boundary and were left with very low diversity in the Cretaceous, only generalists. The one study from 2000 that I read, that's only 20 years old, said the only Cretaceous ichthyosaur genus is Platypterygius. This one group, often portrayed as just the stragglers, the very the last ones of ichthyosaurs, just kind of slowly dwindling until they went extinct in the Cenomanian. The suggestions for why these supposed stragglers went extinct were relatively simple and straightforward. Maybe their food sources diminished. Maybe there was competition. Mm -hmm. We've mentioned before that around the time that ichthyosaurs disappear, we see the rise of mosasaurs. But recent discoveries suggest none of that is correct. (laughs) For one... Cretaceous ichthyosaurs are apparently much more diverse than we used to think. Recent discoveries have found that several Jurassic ichthyosaurs actually did make it across the boundary into the Cretaceous. They didn't just go extinct at the boundary. Other research has looked at Platypterygius and split it into several different groups that reflecting more uh, diversity. And a bunch of new species have been discovered in the Cretaceous. So we actually have a variety of ichthyosaurs of different tooth shapes, ecologies, sizes. There's even overlap where multiple ichthyosaurs lived in the same habitats, the same uh, fossil sites. So there was a diversity of them. Notably, a 2013 study identified a new genus of ichthyosaur, Malawania, from Iraq, that is from the early Cretaceous, but it looks like an early Jurassic ichthyosaur. Oh. Their analysis suggested that its closest relatives are Ichthyosaurus, which is an early Jurassic ichthyosaur, which suggests that the group of early Jurassic ichthyosaurs that include Ichthyosaurus, which we thought went extinct back then, had survivors that made it all the way to the Cretaceous. This was the discovery of an ichthyosaur outside the diversity of all other Cretaceous ichthyosaurs, and suggests, I'm going to bring it back, a ghost lineage callback from the early Jurassic to the early Cretaceous of these uh, more ancient groups of ichthyosaurs. So we know now that Cretaceous ichthyosaurs were much more diverse, much more variable, and recent work has found that there 
isn't very good evidence for an extinction of ichthyosaurs at the Jurassic to Cretaceous boundary. That they went from Jurassic into Cretaceous pretty well. Hmm. The other new thing we've learned is more details about the nature of their extinction. I found a 2016 study that examined ichthyosaur diversity and patterns through the Jurassic and Cretaceous, and found that ichthyosaurs are actually pretty diverse throughout the Cretaceous. They don't seem to suffer a significant extinction event until the early Cenomanian around 100 million years ago. Then they reduce in their diversity, and are left with only a handful of different types of ichthyosaurs, and it's not just them. At this same time, there are major changes in climate and ocean systems, reorganization of ecosystems, including declines in some plankton, ammonites, belemnites, reef builders. There was an extinction event at the beginning of the Cenomanian that seems to have weakened ichthyosaurs, and then at the end of the Cenomanian, seven million years later, a second phase of extinction finally took them out. Wow. That this wasn't just a slow, dwindling, you know, minor changes finally knocked them out, but that they were actually doing pretty well and suffered major ecosystem changes. A literal one-two punch. That took them out. And in terms of the competition suggestion, which I'm pretty sure I said... In episode 51 about Mosasaurs, I made the, the, the smug point that Mosasaurs seem to show up around the time ichthyosaurs go extinct. This paper points out that, according to them, the earliest known true Mosasaurs are a few million years later than the uh, latest uh. known ichthyosaurs. So it might not be that Mosasaurs showed up and wiped out the ichthyosaurs. It might be that ichthyosaurs disappeared and Mosasaurs took over that yeah. space. The only reason Mosasaurus got a chance <laughs> yeah. is because Ichthyosaurus finally decided to give up their vice-like grip with their many fingers on the ocean. <laughs> <laughs> this paper also points out that at least in uh, some in Australia and North America, Ichthyosaurs and Plesiosaurs of large sizes coexisted for like 20 million years before Ichthyosaurs went extinct. Yeah. So it doesn't seem necessary like competition is at least not the whole story. Yeah. So ichthyosaur extinction, not the the slow, uh, you know, dead, dead, dead creatures swimming story that for a long time was the idea. It seems they actually were taken out by some significant changes. Which it both makes sense that they went into the Cretaceous still fairly strong, considering how what big players they were in the ocean scape up until then, uh, but also has that, that baffling thing that so many extinct groups have of they were such defining members of the marine ecosystem for so long. Yeah. Ichthyosaurs show up shortly after 250 million years ago, and they disappear shortly before... 90 million years ago they were around for almost 160 million years for comparison mosasaurs which i love to to brag on were around for about 25 million years yeah like half the time whales have been around exactly <laughs> like ichthyosaurs were around for about as long as dinosaurs yeah just offset a little bit which is always extra shocking at least to me of like the fact that you disappeared at all, right? It's just something, it's so baffling because you were so diverse and so obviously successful that you then just petered. Like, sharks were around during that time, mm -hmm. and we've still got them. They made it. And so it's always, just, it, for me, it puts things into perspective of like, that's such a long time period, and yet still seemingly two extinction events were enough to bop bop yep. and pow, pow. take them out. Yeah. A su surprising, seemingly sudden end to the reign of a very interesting group of animals. Dear ichthyosaurs, I'm sorry it took us this long to finally get to you, but this I think has been a really cool discussion. I the I I have a newfound respect and appreciation for ichthyosaurs. I had yeah no I was just about to say I they have really shot up the list of 
my favorite marine reptiles. Yeah, They're I'm, so cool. I might like them better than plesiosaurs. Yeah, they might have. They might have. I might. They're no mosasaurs. I'm so sorry. Well, it, it's mosasaurs are sea serpents, so they're that's cheating. Ser- and they're squamates. Yeah. And you're just not gonna. They're lizards. I, I'm so sorry. <laughs> but yeah. It, so yeah. If anyone out there felt the same way that I did, that I I had kind of without realizing it assumed they were boring. Uh, indeed. No, they are not. Cool group. And if you want to learn more about ichthyosaurs, we will have links and images in the blog post. Check it out. Hey, before we wrap up this episode, one other thing we like to do is the end of episodes is we read out patron questions. One of the benefits that patrons of a certain level can get on our Patreon is the ability to submit questions for us to answer here on the podcast. What's our question, Will? Our question is from Jessica, who says... The other day, my partner asked me, hey, you know about evolution stuff. Why aren't there green mammals? Which made me so mad because it had never occurred to me before. So I was wondering if you guys had any insight. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. And they do give, uh, Jessica does give a few ideas as to what came to their mind. First, just being that early mammals were ground dwelling and so brown might be good Mm -hmm. and stuff. But their partner pointed out that there are green lizards that live on the ground. And so then they thought maybe it's just that mammals r- really just had not the green pigment and all the rest were good, that that's been enough, that there hasn't been the pressure to evolve green pigments. Yeah, so this is a very good question. Why aren't there green mammals? And in fact, for that matter, why aren't there blue mammals or purple mammals or pink? Birds and reptiles and fish and insects come in all sorts of different colors and mammals don't. Yeah. including green. I, I have an answer to this. In fact, I wrote a SciShow episode about this question. So go check that out. Go look up SciShow mammal colors. But I'll give you the short version. Yeah, mammals are not as colorful. Yeah, why are mammals lame colored? We are lame colored. There are t- two to three different scales of answer to this. The short answer is we just don't have as many tools that we use for colors. Most color in our bodies comes from pigments. So molecules in the skin or the hair that make for color. Among animals, there are pigments for lots of different colors, but we mainly just have melanins, which can give us, at various degrees, white, gray, brown, black, sometimes reddish or even orangish. I can attest. But we don't have the yellows and stuff that you see in a lot of other animals. Green pigments as far as I know, are very rare among animals. Plants have green pigments, but animals rarely do. Blues and greens in other animals tend to be structural colors. So in beetles and bird feathers and reptiles, blue tends not to be a pigment, but the structure of the scale or feather or skin is crystalline in a way that light bounces back out of it blue. Yes. And greens in a lot of animals, like birds and reptiles, are a combination of yellow pigment and blue structural coloration. (gasps) That's awesome. That's why when green snakes die, they turn blue. Yeah. Because they stop producing pigments, so they lose the yellow, and all that's left is the blue structural coloration of the scales. (gasps) That's so cool. That's that's color theory. That's color mixing theory, but you're using different sources. I love yeah. it. Yeah. Mammals manage blues through structural color. Like the face of a mandrill mm-hmm, has mm-hmm. blues in it. Reds are often achieved by flushing the blood vessels under the skin. Think a lot of primates will do this, especially when they're showing off their genitals mm-hmm. to be nice and red. But yeah, we generally just don't use as many different strategies for color as other animals. Then there's the next question. Why don't we use as many different color strategies as for other animals? And one of the big uh, suggested answers is... We're lazy. We are very lazy. And that's it. And that's the whole... Yeah. Slackers. (laughs) Slackers of the animal kingdom. We humans, in our eyes, contain three types of cone cells which receive color. Our three cones are typically attuned to, roughly speaking, the red, green, and blue portions of the color spectrum. Yep. Some people, their uh, cones are a little bit off. Yep. (laughs) Yep, yep, yep. But we are trichromats. 
We have three different types of cones for three different types of colors. That is common among primates. Most mammals are dichromats. Your cat, your dog, cows, most mammals have two different cones, cone types, often for blues and greens. A lot of aquatic mammals are monochromats, typically, I think, in the blue spectrum. But birds and fish and reptiles and insects tend to be tetrachromats. They have four different types of cones, which oftentimes means they can see up into the UV spectrum or they have more visual acuity. Mammal vision is is not great. It's, it, we try not to use, like, you know, better or <laughs> you know worse or more evolved or less evolved when we're talking about the evolution. But, yeah, our vision's bad. Now, we do <laughs> have exceptional low-light vision. Yeah. Mammals are real good at low-light vision. I mean, we aren't. Humans are not No, great. we're bad at all the cool stuff. But when it comes to color vision, we're just not very good at it compared to other animals. So one of the reasons why we might not have so many vibrantly colored mammals might be because we don't see that many colors. So it'd be wasted. And yeah, that, that most of the reason to have bright colors is to communicate. Which, of course, then brings the question to why we don't have uh, as good color vision. And the very short answer to that is maybe what's called the nocturnal bottleneck hypothesis, which actually does get to some of the points that Jessica was uh, guessing at in the question, it is thought through many lines of evidence that mammals in the Mesozoic were often nocturnal because mammals today tend to have genetic signatures of good low light vision, not as much UV protection in our skin, and less color vision, which are all things that make sense for nocturnal animals. So it might be that our ancestors went through a bottleneck evolved a lot of nocturnal adaptations, and then when mammals expanded and diversified, we were working with a limited set of color options in our eyes. Because you don't need to see color at night because light levels are so low, it, it's not really priority. Right. Dark vision doesn't allow you to see color, just shades of gray. Yeah. So, that's a very long answer. So the short version is, yeah, we, we don't have... Green mammals, typically, I mean, like sloths that grow moss in their yeah, fur, I guess. Cheaters. Right? Cheaters. Typically, we don't have green mammals because we don't use the same strategies to create those kinds of colors as other animals. We don't use those same strategies, possibly because we can't see as many colors, generally, as mammals. And we can't see as many colors, maybe because of the dinosaurs. Yep. Yep, yep, yep. Yeah. It's, it's one of those things where you'll often see, you know, either articles or just posts sometimes being like this is what a bird looks like to us but this is what it looks like to the other birds mm -hmm. and all the things they can see that we can't and those are always fun but really that applies to m most of the animal kingdom outside of but like yeah. Yeah. they all see the world differently than us <laughs> yes for these reasons not all fish and not all reptiles have that many cones but many of them do. Some insects are thought, I think butterflies are thought in some cases to possibly have five different types of cones or maybe even six. And then there is the famous case of, uh, what is it, mantis shrimps? The mantis shrimp. That it supposedly has like 16 or some nonsense, which is just ridiculous. You don't need that much. Which doesn't mean they can see that many more colors than us, but it does mean that they have a wider range of things they can see. They can see polarized light, which and we can't perceive. They have better visual acuity. Yes. So there are tetrachromatic humans. Mm -hmm. It is a, a rare case where there are people who typically their, their cone, the ge genetically their cones have split. So they have an extra type of cone that's slightly offset. And they often will have, it's not that they can see different colors, but they're better at distinguishing colors. The opposite of the case in someone like my friend Will, hey, who's probably what your condition is, being partially colorblind, is that some of your cones are tweaked a little bit, which makes it harder to distinguish certain colors. Yeah, to where it's, it's not that I can't see red or green or blue, but the range that looks blue to me is wider right. than your average person. And the range that looks... Green to me is wider, and so on and so forth. So if, if it's kind of bluish, it just it looks basically blue to me. Whilst if you have an extra cone, that blue is split up into many more distinct blues. You can see yeah. the shades and the tones much more clearly 
Well, to me, it's just it's blue. It's just blue. This is a fantastic question, Jessica. Thank you and your partner for asking it. This has been a long uh, response, uh, and I feel like there's so many more things I want to say, which means someone should request that we do an episode about color vision. Yeah, that's <laughs> true. That, yeah, we did yeah. eyes, but that was, we barely talked about color vision. We sure did. Well, in any case, let's wrap up this episode. It has been a long and fascinating discussion about ichthyosaurs, about eyes, uh, all sorts of eye discussions in this yeah, episode. Big eyes, weird <laughs> eyes, colorless eyes. Thank you, everyone, for joining us on this episode. Thank you to all of the requesters who requested it. Thank you to all of our patrons who support us. Hey, if you want to ask a patron question and you're a patron, sign up at the family level and go to that form that we'll send you a link to. Check out the blog post for more information. Check out our new Silver Screen Science uh, uh, episodes that we recently released. Keep your ears out for more special stuff happening later in the year. We release episodes every fortnight. So stay tuned for another episode in a fortnight. Yeah. Uh, ichthyosaur pun. <clears throat> Sign off phrase. Music. Bye. Thanks for listening to the Common Descent Podcast. You can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and check our WordPress blog for pictures and links after each episode. Huge thanks to our patrons whose support helps keep this podcast running and who get access to bonus goodies on Patreon. The song you're hearing is called On the Origin of Species by Protodome, which we found at ocremix.org. Thanks again for listening. We hope you'll join us next time.